I thought tonight would be an interesting opportunity to do sort of a you know, parenthesis, something a little different. And uh, so we have sort of a, a one-night thing we'll do tonight that's sort of an appendix to, to last week's lesson. And so uh, it, uh, it will uh, be more heretical than normal uh, as we... <laughs> And uh, so, uh, uh, because of the exposure into this deep, dark, risky area that we'll go into, uh, let's diligently seek the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you, and thank you. We thank you, Father, for the incredible testimonies that you have placed for our learning. We pray, Father, that you just send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds and, and eyes that we might behold Jesus Christ, know him better, and more fully grasp the miracles that you have accomplished on our behalf. We ask you, Father, to feed us, strengthen us, encourage us to more fully commit to your way and that unique ministry which you have for each and every one of us. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So tonight will be a those of you that are taking notes, you can just consider this an appendix to uh, the, the study we did on the Tower of Babel. Uh, those of you that are, uh, uh, aren't here tonight <laughs> won't miss a thing. <laughs> I knew that as soon as that sentence started, I wasn't going to be able to come out of it gracefully. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we might have fun by starting. Turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to wander around aimlessly for a little bit and then try to tie this all together, so don't panic. Um, Luke chapter 1. And I'm particularly interested in verse 67 and following. This, of course, is the Gospel of Luke, and, and we have here an incident occurring early. Um, And uh, anyway, verse 67, and his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, so we're going to have some words here that are ordained by the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. Anyone's not sure of that? Uh, you should see me after the hour. Um, verse 70. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, right? Who have been since the ages began. Who's that? Would that be Moses? David? Jeremiah? What prophets have been there since the ages began? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Enoch, maybe? Well, he's certainly there. Over, don't let anyone tell you that Adam couldn't read or write, because there's some evidence that he did. But anyway, we won't get into that right now. Uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Peter's second sermon. We're all familiar, familiar with his first sermon. As good charismatic Christians, we're all familiar with Acts chapter 2. We often don't get into Acts 3, but... Uh, Anyway, Acts chapter 3, verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, who before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things. Interesting phrase, referring to the Jubilee year, prophetically. And if you're interested in that whole story, you can get the Joshua tapes. But uh, going on. Which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. For how long? Since the ages began, or the age began, or the world began. Kind of interesting phrase. Kind of um, provocative phrase if you take it literally. And uh, I do. Which leads us into kind of a peculiar excursion that we'll get into tonight. Um, and I think we'll probably start this popping back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 14, 
God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. For what purpose? To divide the day from the night? Good. And what else? Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And, and, and he let them be lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. Interesting thing. Let them be for signs. For signs. Uh, we can't take on a topic like this without being reminded, at least uh, uh, a little bit, of the, the strange passage in Job. The book of Job is uh, full of provocative things. Um, but turning to chapter 38, after all this advice from his would-be friends, uh, God steps in. And chapter 38 and 39 is a couple of the most fascinating chapters in the scripture where God himself comments on himself. You know, the Bible does not argue for the existence of God. It assumes it. And you generally don't find passages in the scripture that are, you know, uh, apologetical on behalf of the nature of, or the existence of God, except on a couple of occasions. The letter that God addresses to Cyrus 150 years he was, before he was born, that's penned by Isaiah in chapters 45 is one such passage. Job 38 and 39 is another. Very interesting to hear God almost, I, would, I don't think sarcasm is the right word, but certainly sort of uh, provocatively raises questions knowing full well Job can't answer. And there's a whole string of these that are just, each one could be a, a study, in a, you know, a lifetime study in their own right. But... Um, uh, we might start with verse 31, where God says, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth the Maseroth in its season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set its dominion in the earth? They go with similar kinds of questions drawn from other fields of science. These references obviously being in interesting because they're drawn from the field of astronomy. And as you can probably have guessed by now, we're going to wander lightly into this area. The word Maseroth that you find here in the book of Job is the Hebrew equivalent of what you would call the Zodiac. The Zodiac. The word zodiac is actually from the Greek, but it's a transliteration of a word from the Sanskrit which comes from a Hebrew word meaning sodai, or the way. And um, it can be the way or the path of the sun in the sky, and it's also, interestingly enough, what is the way a, a, an idiom for in the book of Acts? Well, the church, yeah, following Jesus Christ. Following Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that the Hebrew word adopted by the Sanskrit is the root word from which the Greeks called it the zodiac, which is kind of interesting. What I'm going to generally suggest, so I don't keep you guessing, I'm going to suggest that we have only a faint hint, or corrupt, uh, we're, we're victims of a corrupted uh, record of what the traditions about the stars really are. Our traditions go back to the Greeks, in some cases a little earlier to the Babylonian and Egyptians, and uh, uh, the meaning of the zodiac and the co constellations as we call them actually go far back earlier than that, but were subject to a substantial corruption in uh, the period that we just recently studied, the Tower of Babel. And it's interesting, though, that first of all, we can find from the scripture some su strong suggestion that God had an in original intention here of these things being a witness. And uh, that's what we're going to explore a little bit. We find from Romans chapter 1, which you can read as your homework assignment, not tonight, <laughs> uh, that there is testimony in the universe itself that will uh, bring all the world guilty. And um, it certainly includes the heavens. Now, uh, as we explore this whole area, it's kind of interesting about the zodiac because the signs of the zodiac, and you're all familiar with them from their pagan nomenclature. But what's interesting is, independent of the names, they are the same idioms in every language, in every country, in every culture. That in itself is provocative. You talk about uh, 
I've got the list of them here, so I won't mess that part of it up. Um, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricornus, Aquarius, Spices, um, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo. That sequence is the same all the way, all the way, way back. And, um, uh, but the, uh, well, let's just, as I'm talking long, I'm talking on that. Let's, the Chinese, the Chaldeans, and the Egyptians have records involving the zodiac that go back more than 2000 BC. That's a long time ago. In a couple of temples, temples of Dendera and Esne in the Egyptian background, more than 4000 BC it's been dated. Um, in fact, because of the way they're recorded, these uh, records apparently were drawn when the summer solstice is in Leo. It's presently in Aries. It moves about uh, one degree every 71 years. In fact, let me back up and talk a little bit, give you a little bit of orientation. And I'm deliberately trying not to use diagrams and things, because first of all, it'll be easier for those listening to the tapes, and it also will keep me from getting too, too technical. Um, if you took the equator of the Earth, if you, imag if you imagine the stars that you see as being imprinted on a very large sphere, we'll call that the celestial sphere, we'll ignore for the moment the fact that stars are actually different distances. Visually, they appear relative to one another as if they were on a large sphere. And if you took the equator of the Earth and extended it outward, you would draw a line on that celestial sphere, and that's the celestial equator. And what's um, and if uh, hmm. no, that's the celestial equator. The the sun itself circumscribes an arc through the celestial sphere that's something other than following that equator. And that's because of the, well, it's caused for a lot of reasons, but the primary thing is that we have the, the Earth is canted on its axis. The path, the apparent path of the sun through the sky throughout the year is called, the, there are a series of constellations, in fact, 12 of them, 12 major signs. Actually, the signs consist of a collection of constellations, but there's 12, the, the, the path of the sun, that band, roughly 16 degrees wide throughout the sky is divided into 12 sections, or signs. Each sign actually consists of about three constellations. Now, and you know, uh, in fact, uh, because of the ancient cultural references to those stars by virtue of their position within these imaginary figures, and we'll talk about in a minute, even um, legitimate straight scientists that are interested in astronomy will still reference the stars by their position, their apparent position within these constellations. Where the ecliptic, the ecliptic is a, is like a circle in the sky that's at an angle to the celestial equator. And where it crosses the celestial equator, we call that an equinox. There's a summer and a, and a fall, or a summer and winter solstice, and there's a spring and fall equinox. The equinox, the vernal equinox, the spring equinox, is the arbitrary reference point for all mathematics in the celestial sphere. You and I think of that, if you're, if you're a, a celestial navigator, as being in the, in the first point in Aries. It's in, the, it's in the constellation called Aries. What you may not realize is, just as the Earth revolves, uh, rotates on its axis and is around the Sun, it is also precessing. The angle of the spin of the Earth is at an angle, and the, that angle is wobbling. In order to, to correct our uh, calendar back to a sidereal calendar, we have to add a day every four years, right? You also have to add a day every 25,579 years, and that's because of that wobble. But also, <laughs> just thought you ought to know that, right? What's perhaps more significant is, is that because of that, that, that wobble, that turns out to mean that the equinox, the equinox being that uh, period of time when the sun, uh, when the days and the nights are of equal length, that's when the, when the pa apparent path of the sun is crossing the celestial equator, the equinox point itself is moving through the apparent heavens. And it moves about one degree every 71 years. What's interesting, though, by the ancient records, 
of the constellation, we can roughly date when they were drawn because of what they see because of that precession. And that's how we can infer that some of these records are that far back, four or five thousand years ago, roughly. Uh, now, incidentally, the Persians and the Arabians have traditions that the whole system, ast astronomical nomenclature, started with Adam, Seth, and Enoch. Isn't that interesting? Josephus records it starting with Seth as a tradition, and Enoch preaching two judgments, fire and water, and we'll come out of that and come back to that in a minute. Um, there was a major astronomer about 400 years before Christ by the name of Eudoxos who did a major astronomical work called Phenomena that uh, a certain king, Macedonian king, asked a poet by the name of Aratus in 270 BC to render into poetry, which he did. And the only reason I'm mentioning, and incidentally the poetry's name was called the Divine Signs. What's interesting about this, that poet was in Tarsus and none other than Paul himself uh, on Mars Hill in Acts 17.28. No big deal, but it's just a little cultural reference to prove I did a little reading. Um, okay. And also, before I forget it, those of you that are interested in this area, we're going to summarize it rather lightly, but there are two books that are not in your bibliography that I passed out that should have been, and they will be in any revisions. Uh, one, there, there are actually a number of books on this subject, but there are two references that look pretty good. If you're interested in getting into this in, de in more depth than we'll have time for here, I commend to you uh, two books. The first one by Joseph A. Seiss, S-E-I-S-S. -S. He's famous for his commentary on the Apocalypse, published in 1850. But he wrote a book called The Gospel in the Stars. He published it in 1882 by E. Claxton and Company in Philadelphia. Uh, it's quite scholarly, and there's a lot there, probably more than you really want to know, and yet at the same time, a lot of it may be quite specious. So it's the kind of thing, it's really very, very peripheral uh, material. But a second book, also well known in the same subject, Ethelbert W. Bullinger, published a book called Witness of the Stars in 1893 in London. Both of those can be tracked down uh, by your bookseller if you really are committed to this sort of thing. <laughs> Okay, um, let me switch now. Let's get in the and see what a quick couple of glances and see, I may show you some things that I think may be a little um, unusual. Uh, first of all, turn to Psalm 147. These things won't surprise you, but just to build up our background as we charge into this rather strange area. Um, Psalm 147, verse 4. He appointeth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. The idea of counting the stars uh, is a pretty hopeless task, because the more powerful the telescope you have, the more you just kind of unending. But it's interesting that God has not only is, has them numbered, but each one has a name. I wouldn't infer that the names we're going to talk about tonight are the names he uses. On the other hand, uh, some of them might be right, as by the time we're through you may have You'll come to some of your own opinions about that subject. You might also turn to Isaiah 40:26. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, yeah, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26. And behold, who hath created these things? Who bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for he is strong in power, not one faileth. Same idea. But uh, it's interesting. Okay. Um, let's take a look at uh, one of the most classic references about the night heavens. Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We're all familiar with that verse. We've quoted it many times, sung it, and what have you. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. You and I probably would be, be willing to rest on the idea that, gee, that as you look up in the heavens, you become conscious of the breadth of the creation, the incredible uh, scope of our universe. That's an, that's an attribution to our Creator, and uh, and and that's great. Except, except 
What is the glory of God? Is the glory of God his creation? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the glory of God is his redemption as well as his creation. Now, how does the heavens, how do the heavens declare his redemption or his love or his program for us? That's the question that we're going to explore a little bit. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night uttereth knowledge. You wonder what that means. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Whose voice? The voice of the heavens. What is the heavens saying? So we're going to explore here a little bit. Their line has gone out through all, all, all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And then, in them he hath set a tabernacle, a dwelling place, that is, for the sun. And we're going to be very conscious of the fact that the signs throughout the zodiac, the sun passes through those. And we, we, can, we could um, uh, go to John 3 and speak of the bridegroom. Revelation 21, Ephesians 5, things of that nature. I don't think we need to do that among this group. But we can speak of Malachi 4, where the Lord is spoken of as the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness. Of righteousness. We, we, we think of him as the Son, S-O-N, of righteousness. He's also spoken of by Malachi in chapter 4 as the S-U-N of righteousness. Which is like a what? A bridegroom. Who is our bridegroom? Jesus Christ. That's not just a New Testament idea. It's right here in Psalm 19. Coming out of his chamber and he rejoiceth, rejoiceth like a strong man to run a race. We're going to discover as we look around in the heavens that there's continual reference to the strong man that's coming. The ancients called him by many names. We call him Jesus to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven and a circuit unto the ends of it. There's nothing hit from the heat there, and it'd go on, but uh, that's probably a good um, uh, shot at that. Let's let's sort of peek ahead uh, in our study in Genesis and take a look at Genesis 15, verse. I'll try not to destroy our lesson for chapter 15. Let's just extract one idea here. I'm interested. Let's look at verses four and five. And behold, the word of the Lord came. This is to Abraham, right? This, uh, where the Lord says, Abraham had made reference to Eliezer, his eldest servant, born of his household, who would be his heir, since Abraham, or Abraham at this time, did not have an heir. The Lord said unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth of thine own loins shall be thine heir. Verse 5, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, it's very reasonable to assume, and that's the way we usually teach this passage, is what God is saying to Abraham, well, go look at the stars. Can you count how many there are? You obviously can't. There's The longer you stare at a place you think is blank, the more you'll see a few that you didn't notice before, right? I mean, it's just unending. It's innumerable. And he's saying that and he has to, he has to, well, that's what your offspring is going to be like, right? And Abraham believed the Lord. And, and verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 6, and he believed the Lord and he counted him for righteousness is quoted several times in the scripture where Abraham believed the Lord. Now, a couple problems, subtle problems with this. In verse 5, where it says, you know, count the stars if you can number them and so forth, the word tell and number is the same word in the Hebrew, and what it really means is enumerate in order. Enumerate them in the order and proper sequence. Okay? And what it might mean, I don't want to sell us too strong because I might be wrong, but what it might mean, what is suggested here maybe, is God is saying to Abraham, look at the stars and put, enumerate them in the proper order. So shall your seed be. The word seed is singular. The word seed is singular, and therein lies the problem. Now, if this sounds a little contrived, if you think they're making too much of something here, you might turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Hold your finger here, but turn to Galatians 3. Verse 16. Paul is writing to the Galatians. 
And in chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Paul making a big thing of the singular of seed? You bet. Now, does Paul have in mind Genesis 15? I think so. Skim back here to Genesis, uh, Galatians 3, 6. In this chapter, Paul has already drawn upon the record that we're looking at. In verse 6, he says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. He's in effect quoting Genesis 15, 6. I submit to you, Genesis 15 is the passage that Paul has in mind as he goes through and makes this point of the singular seeds, right? Why am I making a point? Go on from verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they who are of faith, the same are the sons of Abraham. Faith uh, in singing the song said she wasn't Jewish. I have news for her. <laughs> We're all Jewish. Some of us by adoption. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith did what? Preach before the gospel unto Abraham. Interesting. How did Abraham have insight in the gospel earlier? Well, that po one possibility is the, the thing we're exploring is this idea that uh, it's recorded in the heavens. Now, um, we uh, are taking this sort of departure into this sort of strange area, somewhat controversial area, primarily because of our study of Genesis chapter 11 and where we came to the Tower of Babel, right? In Genesis chapter 11, we had this strange, uh, we uh, explored this strange episode where we have uh, Nimrod, the uh, this tyrant, uh, providing leadership which leads to the, the, uh, the uh, establishment of Babel. And the key verse is verse 4, and it said, Come, let us build us a city and a tower. And the way your English Bible probably has it with italics, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad, etc., the proper translation would be, let us build a tower with the heavenlies in its top. It doesn't make much sense at first until you recognize that what it is is a religious combination, religious planetarium thing that has this record of the heavenlies in its top. And uh, those of you that want to follow this whole thing, which is really a pursuit of astrology, and this is where astrology has its roots, can go through Isaiah 47, Deuteronomy 4.15, Amos 5.26 and 27, the first chapter of Romans, particularly verse, verses 21 through 23, Acts 7, 41 through 43, First Kings 23.5, and Leviticus 20, verse 6 for the tape. Those of you that want to track further study on that. But maybe we should uh, not skip over some of these references. Turn to Isaiah 47. I had these really as background references, but maybe lest someone misunderstand me, we should probably jump in and take a look at this. We'll take verses 11 through 14. Therefore shall evil come upon thee, thou, this is speaking to Israel, thou shalt not know from where it rises, and mischief shall fall upon thee, and thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Stand now with thine enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries, in which thou hast labored from thy youth, if so be, thou shalt be able to profit. If so be, that thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Sort of a taunt, a dare, in effect a put down of their idolatrous ways. And what's at the guts of it? Astrology, stargazing, prognosticators. We're not talking about astronomy here, but I would consider the legitimate study of astrophysics, if you will. We're talking here about the occultic use of these signs uh, uh, in, 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 uh, as a form of idolatry. And we could go on through Deuteronomy and Leviticus and find very clearly that astrology, astrology was a capital crime in the, in the camp of Israel. So I don't want anyone to assume that I'm suggesting any kind of a pursuit or interest in the field of astrology. I am going to suggest we take a look at the heavens tonight 
in, and we'll use some of the idioms that the secular world has ascribed and see if we can't, by putting a few things together, get a glimpse of what lies behind those ideas um, before they were corrupted. Now, the first thing that probably has, uh, has struck you, if you have ever looked at the stars and taken a handbook out and talked about the constellations, that the figures that are drawn in no way are laid out by the stars that are in the figures. <laughs> and you've probably had planetarium directors or other people tell you that, well, at one time the stars were in a slightly different place or what have you, so those things looked like the names they were given, and it's just been through thousands of years that they don't look that way anymore. That's nonsense. That's utter nonsense. Those things never did look like the things that they're named after. But it's interesting that the names and the idioms that are used by the so-called constellations are the same in all the cultures and languages, and they all go back to a common root. And I believe that root was prior to Babel, and at Babel we had a satanic corruption of the whole system, uh, Satan being who he, and what he, who he is and what his destiny is. So let's start. We're going to start our little tour with Virgo. What does Virgo mean, do you think? The Virgin. The Hebrew name for Virgo is Bethula. Now, when we speak of, of, of um, the virgin birth, we obviously think of Isaiah 7, right? And we've, in our Isaiah study, spent some interesting time with Isaiah in chapter 7. But let's turn to it now and get the context. This famous verse in verse 14 the Lord himself shall give you a sign, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Terrific. Let's go back a little bit and get the context. Verse 10, moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or what? The height above. Isn't that interesting? And he has said, I will not ask, neither will I test the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, o house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Who? House of David. Behold, not the virgin, the virgin. Very important point, by the way, in any case. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's a reference to Mary. It's also a reference to Israel. Israel, it may surprise you, is referred to as a virgin, as a nation, in Isaiah 37, verse 22. Now, that's not an idiom you're usually you're more familiar with. We're more, we're more familiar with Israel being uh, typified in the idiom of the Old Testament prophets as the adulteress, the harlot, the, 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 uh, in, the unfaithful wife of Jehovah. She's also referred to idiomatically as a virgin that shall conceive is the woman of Revelation 12 that started with Eve to whom the promise was given that this out of the seed, the seed, you know, that the seed of the woman would come forth, right? So there's a double reference here. The virgin, of course, specifically refers to Mary in the virgin birth, but there's also a, a national overtone to this also. Okay, so, um, those of you, and I won't take this opportunity to springboard again into Revelation chapter 12, but it's, it's certainly to understand Genesis 3.15 at the beginning and Revelation 12 at the climax, we have the whole scenario of the woman that brought forth the man-child. It's a very, very important study, which I commend to you if you haven't been through that with us. Okay, now if we look at this line of stars known as Virgo in, the, in our Latin traditions, um, in each of the constellations there is very bright stars, less bright stars, and, and so forth. And they speak of the brightest stars as the first magnitude stars, second magnitude, third magnitude, fourth magnitude, each number being more faint. So one of the interesting things in understanding this cluster of stars arbitrarily labeled the Virgin. It would be interesting to see what the stars' names are. Now, the brightest star is called Spica in the Latin, which means uh, seed of wheat or barley. In the Hebrew, the name of the brightest star is Thera, which means the seed. The seed. Now this thing's getting kind of interesting. We have the seed from a constellation called the Virgin, Bethula. 
And um, the seed, of course, shows up two places in the book of Genesis. We just looked at Genesis 15.5, where God says to Abraham, Put the, review the stars in order by their names. So shall your seed be, singular. Throwing back to what? Genesis 3.15, where God declares war against Satan. Adam fell, Adam and Eve were there. God's first indictment is to turn to the serpent and declare war. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Same word, Sarah. The second most bright star in the constellation of Virgo is, and I forget what the Latin is, I, 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 don't, I haven't tracked that all the way through, it's Semek, which means the branch the branch. That word in the Hebrew, there are 20 Hebrew words that can mean the branch. One of them, Semek, is the only one used exclusively in the Old Testament for the Messiah. It appears four times. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. We're practically there. Let's just turn back a couple pages. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and splendid for those who are escaped of Israel. Next place it occurs is in Jeremiah 23. Verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the earth. And in his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely in his in and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Sitkanus, huh? And uh, chapter 33 of Jeremiah, verse 15, is an equivalent passage. In those days at that time I will cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land, and so forth. It's virtually a repeat of the previous passage. Zechariah, which you all, you diligent students, will all recall immediately, of course, in Zechariah, since we just finished that, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows who sit before thee, um, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch, the Ebed Yehovah. So the concept of the suffering servant and the branch are linked there in the Zechariah passage. It also shows up in Zechariah 6:12. And speak unto them, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Kind of interesting that in the constellation of uh, Virgo, we have, it by the Hebrew name, Bethula, we have Sarah the seed, Semech the branch. Now, in the ancient star charts, from the Greek traditions, you'll find Virgo there with a tuft of wheat in one hand and a branch in the other. And the wheat in the, is the Latin speaker, the star speaker, is a seed. It's the wheat, but it's the seed of the wheat, you see. So it leaves the, what I'm suggesting, what, what seems to be the idea that I am drawn to is that originally there was a scenario you could learn from the star's names that would recount God's redemptive plan. And in the Babylonian institution, that was corrupted into the form of the deities, the, uh, the uh, idolatries, the idols that were worshipped by the Babylonian, you know, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, and the Romans, and it's that tradition that we have in our secular world. But veiled behind that, especially as you study the ancient star charts, and if you can get ones that have the Hebrew or Arabic even names to those, uh, we can get a clue as to what may have been suggested behind them. But now, also connected to Virgo, there is a uh, um, coma. Uh, which the Hebrew word is comes uh, out, which is uh, mentioned in Haggai 2.7, by the way. The Egyptian name for that constellation is uh, Sheznu, or the desired sun. In Haggai 2.7, the Hebrew word is used for the desire of nations, another title of Jesus Christ. Something that's a little more obscure, but also associated in the sign of Virgo, is the constellation of Centaurus, the centaur, which is a in Greek mythology, a, a creature of two natures, part horse, part man. But the concept of the two natures is there, both in the Arabic and the Chaldaic name for that constellation is Beze, which means the despised one. That may sound strange until you recall Isaiah 53.3. He was despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
Okay? And incidentally, that occurs adjacent to another constellation which we never see. It's called the Southern... Oh, now isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that we have in this one constellation of the Virgin the seed, the branch, the desire of nations, the despised one, and the cross? Isn't that interesting? Remarkable coincidence. Um, there's 12 more of these. And that's Virgo. Uh, we could spend more time on that, but uh, below, our, below our, our available time, let's let's move on to Libra. Next sign of the zodiac. If you were in the, if you look across the heavens, by our, our secular rendering, is a collection of stars known as Libra in the uh, in the Latin. In the Hebrew, it's Maznaim, which means the balances. In the Arabic, it's Al Zibena, which means a purchase. In the Greek, it's Agora, which means a redemption. Isn't that interesting? to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. And we have an idea, a concept introduced in our gospel that uh, relates to this perhaps, may help illuminate what may be behind our thinking here. Isaiah chapter 40. We might start at verse 10 to get the pace of Isaiah's passage here. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the, the lambs in his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and hath measured out the heaven with the span and measured the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Very interesting. Very interesting. The balances. The balances. Interestingly enough, two of the stars, um, the Arabic names mean Zubin al Ganubi or Zubin al Kamali. And the Zubin al Ganubi means the price is deficient. And Zubin al Kamali means the price that covers. The Hebrew name for that star is Kafar, which means to cover. And it's used as the word pitch in Genesis 6. But everywhere else in the Old Testament, that word is translated atonement. The price that covers. Also associated with Libra is a uh, constellation known as the crown in the Hebrew Artara. And um, we can, of course, track the crown in Isaiah 28.5, Hebrews 2.9, Zechariah 6, 11 through 12 where the Lord is crowned. And remember, remember in Zechariah 6 where Joshua the high priest is ceremonially crowned, being a king and a priest in effect. You remember that when we studied Zechariah, very significant. And we could spend more time on that, but I think that's straightforward enough that uh, we have very interesting idea, though, that we have the concept of the crown associated with the price of redemption in the balances. Now, let's just move on a little bit and come to the next sign in the, uh, in the zodiac, as it's called, the collection of stars that are called Scorpio. Scorpio. This is an interesting uh, constellation. Uh, the Hebrew is Akrab, which means conflict. Psalm 144, verse 1, that word is used to imply war, by the Lord. The ancient Sumerians referred to this um, constellation as the lawless one or the perverse one. Does that sound familiar? That bring back Is that reminiscent of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Now, um, if, you, if I had an ability to, to show you a slide of the, of the classical sketches of, of, uh, associated with Scorpio, there is a strong man, uh, Ephesus is his, is his uh, I think, Greek name. But what's interesting, if you see the ancient renderings of him, he is restraining a serpent while his feet are crushing the scorpion. Isn't that interesting? Now, what makes that so suggestive, oh, by the way, the names of the stars on his heels, in the one case is Daka, which means to crush, and the other one is Suf, or Shuf, which means to bruise. And what's interesting about this, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 2, when the Lord returns, he crushes, he, he, he uh, puts in the Gehenna 
the lawless one, the Antichrist, right? He doesn't do that with Satan. What does he do with him? He restrains him a thousand years. Puts him in chains, right? Very interesting idea. In the sense that his man is wiped out. But Satan himself is only temporarily restrained. Temporarily for a thousand years. And then turned loose. That, that, that idea is very important in the book of Revelation. It's interesting that even in the corruption of the pagan, the, you know, the pagan corruptions of the zodiacal system is that we still have rendering the strong man restraining the serpent but crushing the scorpion. Very interesting. We have associated with this uh, also the name Hercules in the Hebrew is Gabor, as in 2 Kings 14, 16 and Psalm uh, 19, 5, where he had the strong man, uh, the, the concept of the strong man. And we could we could spend a whole evening on the various traditions of Bhutis and the rest of the the various names of the of the uh, so-called strong man theme in the heavens. But let's move on to Sagittarius. Sagittarius um, in the Hebrew is Kesheth, which means the archer. And uh, we could go through a number of passages, Revelation 6, 2, Psalm 45, verses 5 and 6, where there is uh, uh, the archer. Uh, one of the stars in this uh, associated with Sagittarius, Nashushta, which means going forth. And nearby, there are two other stars, Nesher, which means the eagle. And the eagle, incidentally, is traditionally the enemy of the serpent. We'll come back to that before the evening is over. And uh, Gnosar, which is the harp, which in the Latin is Lyra, Lyra. And uh, we have as a target of all of this Draco, the dragon, the sea monster. And uh, we could just uh, explore Isaiah 26 and 20, since we're right here in Isaiah 26 and 27, chapter 26, verse 1. Yeah, no, excuse me, 27, verse 1. Um, in that day, the Lord with his heart, uh, uh, his hard and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the sea monster that is in the sea. Now, these are either are three serpents or three ways of speaking of the same serpent, but I won't get into that tonight. But it's interesting that... Um, this may be a reference to Draco, the dragon, or the sea monster, or what have you, which in the Hebrew word is Tannen. Let me just move on to Copernicus, which is the goat in the Latin. Now, in the Hebrew, it's either Gedi or Sair, which is uh, uh, words in the Old Testament that are used for kids of the goats of sacrifice. Kids of the goats of sacrifice. The Arabic is Al-Gedi, which means the sacrifice. And from here, we could go into a whole um, side study. We might turn to Leviticus 16, give you a, a quick glimpse, and then you can you can elaborate this on your own if you like. Leviticus 16 has uh, the uh, scapegoat. They have, they have the sin offering, the sin bearer, uh, introduced in... Uh, Aaron uh, offers a bullock in verse 6, and then when we get down uh, verse 7, he shall take two goats and present them before the Lord. Verse 7, the door of the tabernacle, Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, one for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell for an offering. And then we have this interesting thing of the scapegoat, which is elaborated, uh, um, you know, more elaborately the latter part of the chapter. Verse 15, it shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood within the veil, and do... Uh, that uh, with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkled upon the mercy seat and, and before the mercy seat and he shall make an atonement for the holy place and so forth. And there's a whole study we could go into in the scapegoat but I'm just going to suggest at least at one point that this is uh, a possible link to uh, um, to this uh, area. The scapegoat's an interesting study in its own right but it's pretty self-evident. I'll let you go ahead and read that. Okay, let's let's move on to the water bearer, Aquarius. Aquarius, the water bearer. In the Hebrew, it's Delai, meaning water buckets. We, stingly enough, referenced by Balaam in Numbers 27. We're going to be interested in Numbers 24, or 24 and 25. I mean, 24, verse 7. Numbers 24. Turn to Numbers 24. So, um, Balaam is prophesying here. In 
in Balaam's oracle here, we have in verse 7, He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than a gag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Now, what we're going to get into before the evening is over, there are 12 signs in the Maseroth that is mentioned in, in Job. There are also how many sons of Jacob? 12. Uh, which of the signs do you think associated with the tribe of Judah? Leo. Very good. All right. You'll discover, and we'll cover this before we're through, is that there's a sign associated with each of the 12 tribes. In fact, the sign was carried on a pole, so it was an N sign. Ensign. So we get the term. And um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going we're gonna to run into this whole idea again as we study Genesis when we get to Genesis 49, because Jacob, in prophesied, as, as he leans on his staff in his old age before he dies, he prophesies over each one of his sons in order, and he takes us through the Maseroth in so doing. And uh, this Aquarius, uh, or I should say Delhi, the water buckets, refer to Reuben, we'll discover, and, and Balaam himself um, uh, deals with that. While we're here with Balaam, um, yes, verse 17, Balaam is, uh, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. There shall come a what? A star out of Jacob. A star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession, and so forth. Star out of Jacob. Many people associate this prophecy of Balaam in Numbers 25. 24, um, with the Star of Bethlehem. Star of Bethlehem. I also, uh, it, 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 it's interesting to be aware of something else. There is a historian by the name of um, Abu Farag, uh, Faragius who lived uh, in, in the 13th century, 1226 to 1286 roughly, who records that there was a guy by the name of Zoroaster or Zerdusht, if is the other word for him, who was a pupil of a very interesting guy. Do you know who Zoroaster was a pupil of? A guy by the name of Daniel, when he was a big wig in the Persian Empire, under Cyrus the Persian, after he was a big wig with the Babylonian Empire, somewhat in retirement, was called out of retirement to come over to the banquet and explain what was going on. <laughs> and, uh, and the Zen Devesta, which is a religious writings of that group, uh, point out that they're that when a new star occurs in Virgo, that is a big deal. And uh, so it's very interesting that Gabriel, when he gave Daniel the 70 weeks prophecy, uh, may well have given Daniel some other prophecies that aren't recorded in the book of Daniel, which became a tradition by which Daniel organized a priesthood, which became uh, later corrupted into the Zoroasterism, but nevertheless included a uh, sect, a uh, Kabbalistic sect that we know as the Magi. So it's kind of interesting. So... Um, Curious. Um, we have here the water bearer, the buckets, okay? And uh, there are two ways in the scripture. First Peter 1.23 and uh, John 3.5 are two examples. They refer to the water of the word and also the Holy Spirit. Both idioms are used in the scripture. And we get into this heavily when we do the Revelation study. Those of you that are, you can dig back into your notes on that to, to run with that if you like. Meanwhile, we're going to, we'll move on to Pisces, the fish. Latin, the fishies. In the Hebrew, it's dagim, which means also the fish. And interestingly enough, we find this word that's used of the, this sign of the Maseroth mentioned in Genesis 48, 26. Genesis 48, 26. And, uh, to get ahead of ourselves a little bit, we'll take a peek ahead and look at, Gen uh oh. I'm in trouble, aren't I? Oh, boy. Well, let's see if I can... I can't read my writing. Let's see if I can do it another way. I'm not... There, is, there are not being 26 verses in Genesis 48. I am in deep trouble. However, I can... It's 19, apparently. Yes, okay. The word... The, in Genesis 19... I mean, Genesis 48, verse 19... Sorry about that. When I panic, I go into complete shock. Huh? Uh, Genesis 48, uh, verse uh, 19. Uh, Jacob is talking. 
Joseph is talking to his father, and then Jacob responds and says, I know it, my son, I know it. This is when he crisscrossed his hands in the blessing. We'll get to that when we study this part of Genesis. But the, there's a, it says at the end of verse 19, it says, His seed shall become a multitude of nations. That's actually a mistranslation. What it really means is that he will multiply as the fishes do increase. And the word there is dagim. And uh, Pisces, the fishes, are, are uh, references to, could be, may, may be references, uh, to the two sons of Joseph. Okay, And interestingly enough, there's a band between them in the ancient star charts, and the thing that has his hoof right there at the band that connects the fishies is the hoof of Ares, rests upon them. And who is, the, who is Ares? The ram, or the lamb. The lamb, which is kind of interesting, which takes us to the next constellation, Ares. Aries is uh, familiar to astronomers. If you don't know any other signs, you know Aries because that's the reference point for all the other. If you're going to do a celestial fix, all your numbers go from the vernal equinox, the spring equinox, summer, and and that's at roughly in the in Aries. Um, every 71 years, it gets a little further off. It's heading towards um, Pisces. And um, but anyway, getting getting into this uh, Latin. Um, it means the lamb, but also in the Hebrew it's talah, which means it's used in 1 Samuel 7, 9 to refer to as a lamb. And of course, you're all familiar with John the Baptist's declaration of Jesus Christ when he first sees him in public, the lamb of God. Behold, the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. And of course, we could go into many references. We certainly want to include Revelation 5, verse 12. Worthy is the Aries. Okay, well, virtue is the talah, or the lamb, that taketh away the sin of the world. Uh... Okay, now we get into Taurus, the bull. The Latin means bull, and the Hebrew, it, I forget the Hebrew word, I didn't write it down. But anyway, bullock is the way we would have it translated. And um, interestingly enough, this one also seems to refer, the strange usage of it, there are two horns in the bull, and the two horns are regarded as the two sons of Joseph. Now one of the things we're going to find out shortly is that the twelve signs of the Maseroth can equate to each of the twelve tribes of Israel, and if you recall with the twelve tribes of Israel, you've got a problem because there's really thirteen of them, right? It turns out what you really want to do is the tribe of Levi is in the you want to have twelve, you have four camps of three tribes each surrounding the camp with the tabernacle in the middle, and the Levites are to deal with the tabernacle. Well, if you take the Levites out, in theory, that only gives you, it gives you eleven tribes to, to take twelve positions, right? And the way this works is the tribe of Joseph is broken down into two tribes, Ephraim, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Jacob adopts Joseph's sons. When Jacob gets to Egypt, along with the rest of the gang, and so there's Jacob and his twelve sons, Joseph has had two sons from his Gentile bride by then, and these two sons are named Ephraim and Manasseh. Jacob blesses them. That was the passage we read from a minute ago. And he does a strange thing. He crisscrosses his hands, blessing the younger before the older, and that upsets Joseph a little bit, and Jacob says, I know what I'm doing. But he also is adopting them, so there's actually 13 tribes, if you recognize that Joseph is thus split into two. So when you want 12 tribes, you want to count Levi, you count the tribe of Joseph as a tribe. He has a double portion. If you want to hold the Levites out to take care of the, the Ark of the Covenant or the Tabernacle, and you still want 12, then you count Ephraim and Manasseh as two tribes, and you still get 12 plus the Levites. So it's a little shell game going on. It's confusing. <laughs> and, uh, and, when you get to, and there's a whole study, and we'll get into this when we get to later in Genesis. We're going to talk a great deal about the 12 tribes. There's lots of exciting, interesting, interesting things there, and we'll talk about the, the stones and the breastplate of the high priest and the New Jerusalem and the stones there, and we'll get into all that later. But... Uh, Taurus has two, bo two horns, and in some renderings of the twelve tribes against the Maseroth, the two horns are, the, the, that Taurus speaks of the tribe of Joseph and the two horns being his two sons. Um, now this incidentally also is probably where, in the corruption that, occur, that occurs at Babel, we have the worship of the sacred bulls come out of this, and the Egyptian zodiac, Adendra, has the golden calf, as we think of it, but the bull with a sun disc between the horns, the sun disc being the, the sun and the, the, uh, the sun being in the house of Taurus at the time. And Isis, uh, there's also a, which is a, you know, is a virgin born, a virgin born savior is a whole theme through this, so Satan doesn't lose a crack to really screw things up. Um, also associated with Taurus is a 
constellation, if you can't find any other constellation in the heavens, you easily you can find this one. It's Orion. Some people call him the Irish hunter. O apostrophe R Y A N. That isn't the way the Greek spelled it. Um, o R O R I O N. The Orion, the hunter, in the Hebrew called Chisel, which is the strong one. The strong one. And uh, the star near his foot is named Saif, which means bruised. And um, we could, I'm running out of time, so I don't get too much in this, but John 9, uh, Job, excuse me, Job 9 9 and 38 31. Orion is mentioned, also in Amos 5 8. In your English Bible, will mention Orion, but it's actually in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew names and used as such. Okay, uh, another, <laughs> this one's crazy. Another one that's associated with Taurus the Bull and Orion the Hunter is Lepus the Rabbit. Strangely enough, in the ancient star charts, the word that's used there is the one for the enemy. And that's not obvious that a rabbit's the enemy. It's a, it's a strange thing. But it may become clear when you realize the enemy is associated with Ashtoreth, which is also uh, known as Ishtar, and uh, which from which we have the corruption of the holiday, which we worship as, guess what? Easter, right. Which is associated with the Queen of Heaven, whose worship included hot cross buns, believe it or not, Eggs and Easter bunnies. And if you uh, are into that sort of thing, you can turn to Jeremiah 7:18 or Jeremiah 44, verses 15 to 30 to find out all about the Easter bunny and uh, that sort of thing. There is something in the star charts, the ancient star charts, that also deserves a comment here. They speak also of a collection of, of uh, Eridanus, which is a river of fire that flows from Orion's foot that's crushing down and it, it, it rolls up on uh, Cetus, the sea monster. And that's very interesting because it ties to Isaiah 26, chapters 26, verse 21 through chapter 27, verse 1, about the, you know, the, uh, well, remember we just, in fact, we just read part of it where the, you know, with the, the uh, I'll destroy the sea monster, etc. But the fact that it's a, a judgment of fire from the strong one to the sea monster is kind of interesting. And from here we could charge into Daniel 7, Revelation 19, 20, Psalm 53, Habakkuk 3, 5, and Isaiah 30, and some other places. But we'll keep moving. Um, there's also the next constellation in the zodiac is Gemini, the twins. In the Greek, there were two star groups there. Uh, on the right was Apollo, on the left was Hercules. The Latin, they changed the names to Castor and Pollux. And uh, it's from this that uh, Paul's ship gets named, incidentally. It's the name of the ship happens to be in, in Acts 21, 11, the 28, 28, 11. But the Cash and Pollux, these two, the two uh, twins in mythology are regarded as the two sons of Zeus. Now, it's interesting to mention who Zeus was. Zeus lived on Mount Olympus in the midst of the 12 gods of the Greeks. So as we peer back through this corruption you can begin to get a feeling for what might have you know, lain behind all of this. The Hebrew name for Gemini is Thalman, which means joined together. Joined together. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the Arabic names for the two key stars there is El Henach, which means wounded or bruised, and Mabusta, which means tread underfoot. And uh, you can build a, a notion here that what we have in, joined together in one idiom is the righteous judge and the suffering servant. Um, go on to a more complicated one, and that's what we know as cancer, typified by the crab. We don't really have uh, a good Hebrew name for the constellation, at least I was not able to find it, but we do have um, Hebrew names for the two key stars there. Acellus Boreas and Acellus Australis, which means the north, the northern ass and the southern ass. And the um, ass idiom of cancer is tied to Issachar in Genesis 49.11. And we're going to see that when we get to Genesis 49.11, how, how uh, there's that, that link there. Associated with, uh, with this constellation, and instead, of course, the donkey, the ass, is prophesied in Zechariah 9.9 to be the symbol of the coming king to Jerusalem and fulfilled in Matthew 21.5 and so on. Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, you're probably familiar. Big, and little, you know, big Bear, Little Bear, Big Dipper, Little Dipper is the way we think of it. Ursa Major and Ursa Minor 
are named the greater flock and the lesser flock as sheepfolds. And thus may be a reference from John 6, 10, 16 as a, an idea. And uh, now we get to the climax of the whole string of 12, which is the last one left. Leo, right? Which is Aslan in, in, in C.S. Lewis, isn't, right? Okay. <laughs> Hebrew is Arya, which means um, lion. And uh, we might take a, a glimpse at Genesis 49 and uh, take a look at... Um, it actually starts verse 9. 8, excuse me, verse 8. Jacob is going through this, his, his list here. And he's saying, um, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Thy father's children, in other words, your brothers, will fall down before thee. Now he's, he's, he's pronouncing Judah as the royal line. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down and he crouched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? In ancient star charts, Leo is shown as a lion leaping towards his prey and his prey is Hydra, the sea serpent. Okay? Verse 10 is an interesting one. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Very interesting verse because the high priests in Jerusalem felt that the word of God was broken. Very interesting period when the Romans removed the right to capital punishment in their jurisdiction of the the uh, the province of Judea. Uh, the high priests were really upset about that because that was classically from chapter 9 onwards. The right to capital punishment is the right to govern associated with that. And as far as they was concerned, that was the event that caused the scepter to depart from Judah. And they're really upset by that. And of course, then you know that's when they have you know they have a a um, uh, they had the, referring to Genesis forty nine ten, they felt that the scepter had departed from Judah and Shiloh had not come. And they actually put on sackcloth and ashes and went wailing through the streets of Jerusalem because they thought the word of the Lord had been broken. What they did not know is at that time there was a young boy in a carpenter shop in Nazareth learning his father's trade. That they would see see uh, shortly. Um, we will talk more and develop this whole thing when we get to Genesis 49. That's a whole study in its own right. Uh, Balaam also speaks of uh, this. We return to Numbers again, 24. Numbers 24. Verse 9, he crouched, he lay down like a lion, like a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he who blesseth thee and curseth. There's just another reference. I'm not sure it's that fruitful. Um, okay. Now, um, just to sort of tie a few other things together, um, we have, we've gone through 12 signs of the zodiac as we think of them. Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, and Leo. The Virgin, the Scales, the Scorpion, the Archer, the Sea Goat, the water bearer, the fishes, the ram, the bullock, the twins, the crab, and the lion. Now, if we were to sketch a um, map or a chart of the nation, of the camp of Israel as they wandered through the wilderness, the center of the camp was always what? Tabernacle with its one opening, its gate or door, opening to the, to the east, right. Now, and the, and the tribe of Levi was assigned the custody and care and, and, and uh, administration of the tabernacle. So they were in the center. And if you want to do a little sketch of the camp, visualize it as square. And there's three tribes to the north, three tribes, three tribes to the east, three tribes to the south, and three tribes to the west. North, south, east, and west. Total of 12 tribes. Since we've gotten Levi out of there, that means you take the tribe of Joseph, break him into two, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, to the east, we had three tribes, Zebulun, Issachar, and Judah. The three tribes camping to the east were collectively known as the camp of Judah. And they would rally around the ensign of Judah, all three tribes. 
Zebulun's sign was Virgo, virgin, Bethula, I guess, I should call it. Issachar was uh, Cancer the Crab, or, or the Bruner. And Judah, of course, was the Lion. But they would all rally around the ensign of Judah to the east. On the other side of the camp, to the west, we had Ephraim and Manasseh and Benjamin, and uh, which was Taurus the Bull and Gemini the Twins, or the equivalent in the Hebrew, I really should say. Uh, to the south, we had Reuben, Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, Aquarius, Pisces, and Aries. Reuben being Aquarius, the water bearer, but the water bearer was what? A man. A man. A man bearing water, but it was a man. So Reuben, the sign of Reuben, the ensign of Reuben was the man, but it, the sign that we think of that correlates with that would be Aquarius. Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. That leads us to the north, in which we had Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. Now, the sign that corresponds to Dan is Scorpio, the lawless one. And it's interesting that that's consistent, at least, with this tradition that the Antichrist was to come from the tribe of Dan. And we find, very interestingly, in the tribal lists, we'll study this when we get to Genesis 49, the tribe of Dan is not listed in the 12 tribes that are sealed in Revelation 7. They're, in, they're conspicuous by their omission. In fact, even Eve isn't listed directly. It's listed indirectly because it, because Manasseh is listed and then the tribe of Joseph. Well, if you take Manasseh out, what's rest left of Joseph? Ephraim. So that list is kind of interesting because Ephraim and Dan are the means by which idolatry entered the land, and we'll get into that when we study that. But Dan's sign would be, in theory, the scorpion. However, there's a, we substitute for Dan the traditional enemy, namely the eagle. The eagle. And Asher is the Sagittarius and, or the Archer and Naphtali the, the goat. And, uh, those will be, and at least that leaves, leaves one of the twelve signs, namely the scales. Okay. The price that's sufficient, redemption, etc. with the tribe of Levi in the center of the camp. Now, what makes this particularly provocative is that around the camp of Israel, you then have four ensigns. You have an eagle, a lion, a calf, and a, uh, and a and a man, man, which are the four faces of the cherubim. Every time we see the throne of God, whether we see it in uh, Ezekiel or whether we see it in Isaiah, Isaiah six, or whether we see it in Revelation chapter four and five, very interesting that the, the camp of Israel in the model of the tabernacle was a model of heaven, even to the extent of emulating the cherubim. And uh, if you're interested in that, you can get the tapes on the Revelation studies where we I think, get into that a little bit when we talk about the, the throne room of God and how it was foreshadowed in the tabernacle structure and in the camp of Israel broadly. And also the four Gospels are mapped against those four ideas. Been through that? It's a whole other study, I suppose, and we're over time already, but it turns out that, the, that if you study the, the mission of the four Gospel writers, Matthew being interested in the Messiah, the Messiah, he's a Levi, he takes the, recounts the family tree from Abraham on through the royal line to prove that Christ was the Messiah of Israel, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what Matthew's preoccupation is. His role is a suffering servant. The symbol of servant was the ox. He, a servant you don't care about his pedigree. It's the only gospel without a genealogy. If you in key phrases, each gospel it all supports those ideas. They're very interesting. Um, Luke, of course, is interested in, 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 in Christ as the Son of Man. His humanity takes a genealogy from Adam on and through the natural line, that is through Mary. Um, and uh, is interested in, in, you know, the great emphasis in Luke is, is in, in his humanity. And, of course, that leaves John in his, uh, uh, preoccupied with Jesus Christ as the Son of God. His genealogy addresses his pre-existence, the Gospel opens. And his whole thrust is the deity of Jesus Christ. But those four map, interestingly enough, against the, the four uh, idioms, if you will, or thrusts or concepts of the cherubim as an idea. Now, we're running a little over time, but uh, this has just been a, a kind of a, an excursion as background to what might have gone on at the Tower of Babel as man who at that top till that time, up through the flood maybe, had a tradition and understanding of God's plan through the stars as one of the ways that God revealed himself, declared his plan towards men, 
and man found a way to corrupt that. And uh, on the one hand, it's interesting, and those, I've given a couple of references to those that you want to study. Uh, it's really a side trip because we have the, the, the value, the benefit, the, uh, the advantage of a more a fuller revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ himself, as uh, described in the 66 books that are in front of us, highlighted or climax in the book of Revelation, and uh, as we have even better yet, an opportunity to know him personally. So these these references that are uh, astronomical or interesting his, history or background to our study of uh, Genesis and these in, in, in these obscure beginnings. Um, it, it occurred to me because of all the interest that was expressed last time in this side issue and the fact that we had sort of an isolated evening separated by a couple of absences here might be a good excuse to to swing through. But um, I think as you uh, um, go out on a summer evening and see the heavens and as you get a chance to to if you're drawn that way because of your interest to to learn the heavens and, and play out of the stars then I would commend to you the uh, the learning of at least enough of the uh, the uh, Hebrew traditions behind those uh, constellations to uh, wouldn't be hard to weave that together into your knowledge of the scripture and God's redemptive plan and uh, so I uh, in that sense, uh, I hope that glorifies him.